Chapter 13, Viruses. In this chapter, we're going to be covering the following topics. Characteristics of viruses, classification of viruses, viral replication, the role of viruses in cancer, culturing viruses in the laboratory, the question of whether viruses are alive, and other parasitic particles, virioids and prions. Some of these topics are quite short, so we're going to be combining them. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Characteristics of viruses and classification of viruses, chapter 13. The learning objectives for this topic are discuss viral genomes in terms of double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, and the number of segments of nucleic acid. Explain the mechanism by which viruses are specific for their host cells. Compare and contrast viruses of fungi, plants, animals, and bacteria. Discuss the structure and function of the viral capsid. Discuss the origin, structure, and function of the viral envelope. And list the characteristics by which viruses are classified. Under the characteristics of viruses, we're going to talk about characteristics of viruses in general, the genetic material of viruses, hosts of viruses, sizes of viruses, capsid morphology, viral shapes, and the viral envelope. First up, characteristics that are common to all or almost all viruses. They are all acellular. They are missing parts of a cell that make them not a cell. They don't have ribosomes, generally speaking. They don't have a cell membrane that they make themselves. They don't have an independent metabolism, and so on. Now they all have a genome or nucleic acid that codes for genes, that code for proteins, but they can come in RNA or DNA, which is entirely opposite from what happens in cells. In cells the genome is always DNA. All viruses have a capsid or a protein shell that protects the genome when the virus is outside of the cell. Some viruses have an envelope. An envelope is a lipid bilayer that they pick up from the host cell as they're leaving. And then lastly, we call viruses that are outside of the cell a virion. Now in the last slide I mentioned that the genetic material of viruses comes in both DNA and RNA. So let's go over the various forms that the genetic material of viruses can come in so that it's not quite so new when we talk about how viruses replicate this genetic material. First off, let's go over the DNA genomes that are found in viruses. First off, double-stranded DNA. This is most like cellular DNA, forms a helix. Then there's single-stranded DNA which is unlike cellular DNA. In the cell, DNA doesn't ever come in single-stranded form. Even when it's replicating, it very quickly becomes double-stranded. Then for RNA, we have double-stranded RNA that's like double-stranded DNA, but we never see that inside of a cell. Cells simply do not have large stretches of double-stranded DNA that forms a helix. Then there is the positive sense single-stranded RNA. And it's like cellular mRNA. It's like an mRNA that escaped a cell and went bad and is pillaging the countryside. Then there's negative sense single-stranded RNA. This is unlike cellular RNA. Basically, you have to make a copy of the negative sense single-stranded RNA so that you can get an mRNA that the ribosomes can clamp onto. I know this is very confusing, but repetition helps an awful lot, which is why I bring it up more than once in this presentation. Untahus of viruses. Viruses have glycoproteins, or they're also called spikes, that attach to cellular receptors. That's the first step in the virus infecting a cell. They've got to be able to grab a hold. Now, because this receptor on the virus and the cellular receptors 
have to interact. It's kind of like a lock and key situation. The viral receptors have to fit specific cellular receptors, and this is what determines the host cells of viruses. And we'll talk more about that in the next slide. But I do want to mention here that these cellular receptors did not evolve for the benefit of the viruses. They're doing something else. For example, with herpes simplex viruses, they attach to heparin on the surface of mucosal cells. That heparin is involved in connecting uh, cells to each other. They are not there for the herpes virus to get in, but the herpes virus takes advantage of it to be able to attach to the cells and then enter. So because of this re viral receptor, cellular receptor interaction, most viruses are very, very specific for their hosts. So human viruses do not, generally speaking, infect our, our most close relatives, chimpanzees because we've got different receptors on our cells. And some s viruses are so sp specific, uh, those that attack the oral mucosa are different than those that would attack the intestinal mucosa. In other words, herpes simplex is not going to cause gastrointestinal distress like norovirus. They have different receptors. But some viruses have, rece have receptors for cellular receptors that are broad enough that they can cross species barrier, barriers. Polio virus is one of them. In fact, with the uh, Jane Goodall Institute that, uh, where they study the chimpanzees, because humans have passed polio to the chimps on occasion, they no longer allow this kind of close interaction that they used to. Let's talk about another virus that has a very broad host range, canine distemper. Canine distemper causes diarrhea in puppies. It can kill them. Now, you would think that that would stay within the domesticated canine population, or maybe go to wolves since they're so closely related to dogs. And in Africa, canine distemper has infected the wild dog population so that they're dropping significantly. Basically, their puppies are dying from it, and it's kind of hard to vaccinate a wild dog. That kind of makes sense. It's kind of like the polio situation. But it has gone from the uh, domesticated dogs and the wild dogs to the lions. Lions are in carnivora, but they're not terribly closely related to dogs. But canine distemper has been able to jump to lions, and it's causing a decrease in population of lions in Africa, too. And it's gone to hyenas. Hyenas are carnivorous, carnivorous, they're in the same big group, but they're more closely related to mongoose. They're even less closely related to these guys than the cats are to the dogs. And it's jumped from there into the weasel family. And from there, it's gone into seals and other marine mammals. Canine distemper has a receptor that is common to all of these mammals. And in fact, we think that canine distemper was part of what wiped out the Tasmanian tiger, which is a marsupial, which is not terribly related to any of the rest of these placental mammals. So canine distemper is an example of a virus with a very broad host range. Also, the book mentions a West Nile virus, which can infect insects and humans and birds and horses. That one also is looking for a cellular receptor that is common to all of those animals. Now, the last one that I want to talk about is SARS. SARS, we think, originally, jumped from cervids, which are related to weasels. Now we're thinking that it was probably fruit bats. But once again, we have a virus jumping from one class of animals to another class of animals. We call these zoonotic infections. And you have to keep an eye out for them because they're generally new. We're not used to it. We're not used to the symptoms with treating it. And we definitely don't have a vaccine for it. Next up, sizes of viruses. I like this diagram because it gives you an idea of about 
how big viruses aren't in relation to the cells. So we have a eukaryotic cell, a human blood cell, and then we have a bacterium. This is probably E. coli, and you can see that the eukaryotic cell is significantly bigger than the bacterial cell. Now down here we got some little dots. If we blow up this picture we can see, oh, here's some viruses. Some of the bigger viruses you can see they're about in relationship, about as small to the bacterium as the bacterium is to the eukaryotic cell. And that's for the big viruses. We've got a pox virus here, we've got a bacterial phage. Now here we're showing ribosomes, bacterial ribosomes within the bacterial cell. Most viruses are about the same size, maybe a little bigger, as one of the ribosome subunits. So that gives you an idea of how incredibly small viruses are. In fact, originally viruses were called filtrable infectious agents because in the early days of the germ theory they found that they could filter out cells, things that you could see under a microscope. But sometimes the fluid that went through was still infectious and it's because these are so small that they can pass through the pores of the filter. Next, let's talk about some of the structure of the virion. We're going to start with capsid morphology. Now the genetic material is inside of the capsid. The purpose of the capsid is to protect the genetic material of the virion until it can enter a host cell. Now the capsid can come in different shapes and we're going to talk about that in the next slide, but the capsid is made up of subunits called capsomeres. Sometimes, like in this example, they're all the same. Sometimes they vary in shape so that you can get a different shaped capsid. So what are these shapes? Some viruses are little rods and the capsid is helical. We have capsomeres that bind together to form a helix or a tube and the genome goes inside. Then others form more of a circle. You can see that there's sides in there. We call those polyhedral viruses and the most common kind is icosahedron viruses like in this example where the capsid has 20 sides. Then we have complex viruses where you can see we took a polyhedron and slapped it onto a helical capsid and then we have tell fibers or basically these are the receptors for the bacterial cell. Then we have other complex shapes. This is rabies virus and if you look really careful you can see that there is a helical capsid inside but the envelope, which we have on some viruses, has caused it to fold. Speaking of viral envelopes, let's talk about what they are. Some viruses are what we call naked. They have just the capsid and the genome and that's it. Whereas others have a lipid bilayer surrounding the capsid and their receptors are embedded in that envelope. Well, they get it from the host cell. They do not manufacture it themselves. They do not have genes for enzymes to make lipids, so basically they steal it from the host cell. Here's another example of an enveloped virus. Now like I said, not all viruses have envelopes and that's part of how we classify them is whether they're a naked or non-enveloped virus or whether they're an enveloped virus. And if you remember back to the chapter on environmental control of microbes, enveloped viruses are easier to inactivate than non-enveloped viruses and it's because you can take a detergent and bust up that envelope and all of a sudden the cellular receptors are gone and the virus can't attach to a cell. That's why they're so easy to inactivate when they're not surrounded by bio burden of course. Now let's talk about the classification of viruses. The International Committee on the Taxonomy on Viruses was formed so that we can have one way of naming viruses. Leads to less confusion when you have one name 
for each kind of virus instead of 15 different names in the publications. So in the textbook, it talks about how the first thing that we divide them by is the type of nucleic acids. We separate the DNA viruses from the RNA viruses, and then we separate the single-stranded DNA from the double-stranded DNA, and so on and so forth. Then we talk about whether it has an envelope or not. All the envelope viruses that are, have single-stranded DNA go together, all of the naked viruses that have single-stranded DNA go together. Then we classify them on shape. Are they helical? Are they icosahedral? Are they complex? And then we go with size. Now, viruses range in size from 10 nanometers to the really big ones are 400 nanometers. Now, the book doesn't mention this, but actually the first thing that we classify viruses by is by the host. We separate the animal viruses from the bacterial viruses, from the plant viruses, from the fungal viruses. That's just what we do. And it's such a duh type of thing that the book didn't even mention it, but I want you to keep that in mind. That's it for these couple of topics. Here are reminders of what you need to learn from these topics.